Chancellor, the Honorable Michael Wilson, Dean Christina Amon, Professor Elizabeth Edwards, Professor Leventa Diosadi, Professor Yuling Chen, Vice President and Provost McGurr, members of the faculty and staff of the university, students of the graduating classes in the School of Applied Sciences and Engineering, and your proud families and friends who are here to celebrate your accomplishments. I'm honored to join you today at this convocation for the School of Applied Sciences and Engineering, and I'm humbled to be conferred with the degree of Doctor of Science and join a list of so many distinguished and outstanding individuals who've been accorded this recognition over the past years. I'm additionally privileged to be among more than 18,000 of the world's newest great minds who are graduating from the university this year. This is indeed a proud moment for all of you. You have gone through the rigorous training and testing at one of the top universities in the world and are being awarded the degree that will launch your careers and set you on diverse paths to achieve your goals, aspirations, and dreams. Along with your families, your professors, peers, and friends, I too am excited to witness the heights that you will reach and the contributions that you will make to the world. As Levante briefly mentioned, I started my career in India in the salt industry, and my family had been in the business of producing salt for over five generations. On completing my undergraduate and graduate studies in chemical engineering, I started my career with corporate aspirations to grow the business and make money. But a chance meeting changed all that. I was on a domestic flight in India and sat next to an American working in the development sector. He had an idea that calcium could be added to salt as a means to correct severe forms of deficiency prevalent in the country. He was looking for a salt manufacturer to work on this. Fortuitously, there I was sitting next to him on the plane. We started to talk and followed up with several meetings. I was blown away by the potential that something as simple as salt could play such an expanded role in correcting basic nutritional deficiencies and in improving the health of millions of people in such a sustained manner and at such a incrementally small cost. This led me to the world of nutrition as a way to correct deficiencies in diets by enriching staple foods like salt, wheat, rice, and cooking oils. Today, this has become my primary career focus. I realized that healthy nutrition could be the pathway to building better bodies and better minds. Clearly, the best strategy to ensure that future generations get the best start to he live healthy and productive lives. 46 years ago, I was where you are today, graduating from university. The world was a very different place. We had one central computer in my engineering school, less powerful than your handheld device today. No internet, no mobile phones. In India, where I grew up, we did not even have television at that time. Today, the pace of change is accelerating at an unprecedented level and is redefining the way we live and work. Every week when I read just one uh, bulletin, the news bulletin issued by the University of Toronto, I'm amazed and energized at the constant flow of new ideas, breakthroughs, inventions, awards and achievements, and all of this from one university, and this epitomizes what is happening everywhere across the world. The driving force for all of this is undoubtedly technology. We are fortunate to be living and working in these exciting times. Each of us has the opportunity to build on this momentum, forge productive and meaningful careers for ourselves, and contribute to the well-being of our planet. The task before you may seem daunting and confusing at times, particularly in today's context of a very rapidly changing environment. Yet, I believe that the underlying principles that will guide you to make the right choices remain un unaltered. Let me offer you three brief insights stemming from my own experience that might help. First, on your career path. There is no single predetermined career path for you. There is no limit to mix and match your skill sets and what you can do. And there are no rules that you stay on one career trajectory. So aim to expand from your core technical expertise in different directions. Be prepared to go off the beaten track 
make unusual decisions and go in non-linear ways. I have personally transitioned from chemical engineering to nutrition to health and more recently to agriculture. Seize opportunities when they arise and be willing to make mid-course corrections. For most of you, it's very likely that rather than being the outcome of well-constructed plans, your careers will evolve through a combination of circumstances, fortuitous happenings, and your own instincts to seize opportunities when they appear. In 1994, when I came here to, uh, to the University of Toronto for a meeting, I met a gentleman from Ottawa. After the meeting, he invited me to have coffee with him. My first inclination was to decline and head home, but on second thoughts, agreed. And over coffee, this gentleman told me of a job opportunity at the International Development Research Center in Ottawa, where they had just created the Micronutrient Initiative. He said that I stood a good chance to get the job if I were interested. Once again, I demurred and thanked him and said I was well settled in Toronto with no intention to move. I returned home and recounted the conversation to my wife, Vijaya, and she was aghast. Cold or no cold, we shall move to Ottawa, she said. <laughs> Within less than an hour, I was on the phone, recanting my earlier response and confirming my interest in the job. We moved to Ottawa to a very meaningful career in life, and I've been there ever since. Second, on a multidisciplinary approach, have an open mindset to work with different people from diverse disciplines. My own work required me to collaborate with physicians, public health specialists, food technologists, communication specialists, and economists. And often I used to be in rooms where everyone else in the room was a medical doctor. But I believe that my scientific and engineering training has helped me absorb key pieces of knowledge across a range of disciplines and effect effectively apply this to address issues related to health and nutrition. Also test the limits of your own potential. I always cite the instance of the bumblebee. As some of you know, aerodynamically, the ratio of the wingspan of the, to the body weight of the bumblebee does not permit it to fly. But the bumblebee doesn't know this and goes ahead and flies anyway. And finally, on technology and development, uh, being an area where I have moved into from chemical engineering to uh, uh, international development. In all parts of the world, governments are no longer seeking charity and being told to do things. What they need are skills and technologies within the context of their own cultural and political environments and plans. The health minister of Ethiopia, Dr. Tedros, once remarked to me, Venkatesh, what I value most in the assistance that you provide to my country is not the money. There are many, many larger donors at my door. But it's your unequivocal support to my country's plans and needs, and your personal willingness to work within this framework without imposing your own views. There is also evidence from other countries, especially in Southeast Asia, that have grown rapidly over the past two or three decades and have done so with minimal direct development assistance. We also have the opportunity now for relatively low-tech, inexpensive solutions that can have huge impact. In my own uh, experience, the cost of adding iodine to salt is a fraction of a penny per person per year, and yet can make so much difference to correct a major nutritional deficiency, and the risk of mental retardation with significant economic benefits as well. Beyond the technology, it is also about working with governments and other organizations to make things happen. Sometimes it just boils down to identifying key individuals and convincing them to initiate the required policies. In China in the 90s, when we as a team with the World Bank were trying to convince the government to iodize all the salt we met with the then finance minister, Mr. Jurong Ji. The argument that really struck a chord with him was the fact that a lack of iodine in the diet could potentially affect the mental development in millions of infants and the potential of future generations of China. Within a year, the government had issued orders and 98% of the salt was iodized. I'd like to close by accepting this recognition by the University of Toronto 
with humility and acknowledging with deep gratitude the tremendous support many people in my life, my parents, my family, my teachers, mentors, fr friends and colleagues have provided me. Both our sons graduated from the University of Toronto and have joined us here today along with my wife Vijaya and the rest of our family today to mark the conferment of this great honor. Thank you very much.